Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this special recording. Um, this is a sermon that has been on my heart and also challenged to me by Pastor Moses talking about faith over fear and having peace. I'm very honored to have this challenge, to have this tonight, and it's been something that has been marinating on my heart for a little while. Uh, we can often get overburdened. I mean, we wearing a yoke that is so heavy for us to be wearing in our own life that it obscures the heart of the Lord for us to have and be actioned in our daily lives. So our faith and understanding what our faith is, what the Bible says about faith, what it says in contrast to fear and taking ownership of the peace that Christ has given us, I think are all crucial components that in a time of COVID, in a time of even, well, look, let's just actually remove COVID out of this. In a time of daily circumstance, of the, the molding, the, the rhythm of life, uh, it can all get heavy. Um, but faith is the opposite to that, hep, uh, to that heaviness. Faith clings to hope. Faith clings to prom promise and faith clings to light and a future. I want to just take a few, uh, I mean, m minutes of your time to try and unpackage some of these things. And I thank you if you're watching this. And I hope this touches someone tonight or wherever you're listening to this. Lord bless you for tuning in to Communion House. Um, it's my honor and privilege. I am Will Holiday, the outreach pastor here at Communion House. And yes, come on home with us. Our mission at Communion House is to fellowship, equip, and disciple you to be the best Christ-born witness that you can be. So make sure to get in tune with our Instagram, our social media, our Instagram, our social medias, like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and connect. There is a lot of material that we have produced over many months for you to get connected into, including sermons like um, how to know yourself in Christ Jesus, how to know your identity, the power to be more. Thank God for me. There's been some great Holy Spirit filled sermons this last week. Well, they're all Holy Spirit filled, but I tell you there has been something infectious this last few weeks. And no, I'm not talking about COVID. I mean infectious these last few weeks that have proved a spark in people's lives and have ignited something new in them. So maybe that is an example of faith over fear. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. Thank you, Father, that you're with me. Thank you that it says in your word that you shall never leave us nor forsake us. That it says in your word that you have never seen the righteous forsaken or your children begging for bread. Thank you, Lord, that you tell me to be bold and courageous, to march forward because you are with me wherever I go. And Lord, let us take in installations these products of your, con of your covenant, these installations of your promise, these installations of your heart and prosperity for us. And Lord, as we reveal of these things, as these things are revealed to us tonight, I pray, Lord Jesus, that something just begins to change right here that then eludes and exudes and drips into every orifice of who we are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Faith over fear. You know, faith, it said, you can't buy it, you can't sell it, and you can't give it. Let us start by going to Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of this lake. So they got into the boat and set out. And as they sailed, he, Jesus, fell asleep. A swell came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples awoke him saying, Master, Master. We're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asks that he asked his disciples. In fear 
and amazement, they asked one another, imagine this, who is this? He commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him. Luke's Gospel 8, chapters, uh, verses 22 to 25. Now, if we take time to read the verses prior to this event, Jesus had recently just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Immediately after coming down the mountainside, the the disciples witnessed Jesus perform many miracles. He healed a man with leprosy. He healed a centurion's servant, that great statement of faith, by just speaking a word. He touched Peter's mother-in-law and her fever left her. That same evening, he went out and healed people that are demon-possessed. And all the sick people that were brought to him were also healed. But after this, after all of that, Jesus says to the disciples, let's go. Let's leave this place. You've been in this vicinity. You've seen me do these things. This is not things that he said, but these are things in context that I want you to realize. They'd been in his vicinity. They'd been in that locale. And now they were heading over a body of water, a small body of water, to another site. But... I guess in the testing of their faith, Jesus wanted to see if we maneuver from this place to the next, if we go from country to country, if we go from village to village, if we go from circumstance to circumstance, job to job, role to role, do you believe what happened before can happen now and can happen then? Mark 4.39 adds this. When he said, when he arose, when when they managed to finally wake up Jesus, he said, he arose and rebuked the wind and said these words, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. That word peace there is interesting. Peace, peace, peace. Remember, there's two questions that I want to you to really be focused on. Where is your faith and peace? Be still. Two key points of the scriptural analysis. So let us dig deep. Peace. Let's dig deeper on that word. Peace in Strong's exhaustive concordance. The Greek for it is S-I-O, or it's from S-I-O-P-E. And that that is basically, let me try and pronounce this, C-O-P-A-P. C-O, pao. For all the Greek scholars out there, I apologize if my pronunciation is not up to standard. But let us dig it out. So it basically means be silent, hush, properly be muted. And in voluntary stillness, so this is Jesus taking absolute command to make it, it's not, there's no rhyme or reason or I can argue with this. No, it was an involuntary silence placed upon the storm by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no voluntary refusal, there's no debate, there's no speaking, there's no terms, there's no contract. It's basically made, now this was really cool. Now listen to this. This was really cool when I studied this. It was basically made deaf, made dumb, and to be calmed and quieted to a level of absolute peace. Wow. Know that we have that authority, that when there's storms going on in our life, we are sometimes moaning, complaining, running every rhyme and reason of procedure and saying, oh, well, if you only knew if this T was crossed and this this I was dotted and we would like to nitpick every circumstance that we could say, hey, Lord, I take command over this situation. I speak on the authority of Jesus Christ's name and I say, be silent, be at peace for my peace the peace that the Lord has paid for me to have, I can own by faith, by my faith, by the measure of faith, by the gifting of faith that he has placed in me. Maybe I'm giving away too much already. See, it's of utmost importance for us to have faith. You see, Isaiah said himself, if you're not firm in faith, you're not firm at all. What a conundrum. What a conundrum. That means if we're not firm, what is, what is the, the difference to firmness? That means there's a slackness, there's a malleableness. There, you can, like a piece of grass in the wind, it could flop, flop, flop from one side to the other. We don't want to be like that. We want to be when the impact of the wind comes against us, that we are staunch, that we are stalwarts in God's goodness. We want to, because 
if we're blown here too, in that circumstance, we have come to a day and an age of faith where less people, less and less people, sorry to go off screen, less and less people are reading this, and even the best of us need to improve our knowledge on this, but less and less even churches are believing and confessing the word of God. And in being so, there becomes a, almost a parody of what a Christian is. They look at the lives of us for their example. But yet there are some Christians speaking on the public stage and the renowned arenas that are not doing what I would say is justice to what we should be doing. So let us make sure our faith is firm. So let's dig deeper. What, how do we make sure our faith is firm? Well, let us first say this. What is the opposite of faith that we need to guard against? Well, the opposite of faith is doubt, fear, a questioning of the goodness of God and whether he will truly show up in the circumstance. It's a stance, therefore, of unbelief. But a stance of unbelief like the disciples had, they should have known better. They've seen Jesus operate many miracles in and around them and via the experience and the faith manifest in them, they should have been exposed enough through the reality of revelation revealed to them that in this circumstance, Jesus will be with us. He's not going to allow us to drown when we've just seen people healed. He's not going to allow us to be subdued when we've just seen demons cast out. He never said, now, I think, I mean, in all sense of the word, I think we would have been, or the disciples would have been prophetically warned that this is not a place that we should go. No, this was a testing of our faith. And for due reason, that only the Lord knows many times, he puts us through these tests of faith. And I hope that we will unpackage that tonight. Wouldn't didn't they have learned anything from the centurion? The centurion, for instance, and the healing of his servants, he said, no, 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 you don't need to come to me. All you need to do is say the word and I know they shall be healed. Wow. We need that faith to lay aside our own understanding in the natural and take the little, even the little that they had began to experience. Oh, you're getting it now. The little that they had began to experience because there's so much more that they could have in faith. The little that they began to experience could be mountain moving faith. The Lord loves making mountains melt and reappear elsewhere. We've forgotten miracles like that. Oh, that people were trembling in terror at the majesty of the Lord's cloak in darkness. But yet the mountains are skipping like lambs. Our faith can make mountains skip like lambs. What is it that is holding you back? What is it that has you so conundrumed that you need to, that, that you feel like in black chains? Come on, say to that. Say to the Lord, Lord, help my unbelief and snap these chains off me because I'm not going to be held in these stocks. I'm going to run to the stock of heaven. Oh, yes. Let's get there. So that was all a part of a Bible study that I've been doing. But again, 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 remember, these disciples should have known better. But let it be a good example to us that maybe there's stuff in our life that we've seen. We've seen the cousin healed the cancer. We've seen the grandfather figure's heart go from, this is just some, by the way, this is some personal miracles in my life. We've seen my grandfather's figure's heart be healed from a percentage that wasn't livable to livable. These are not normal circumstances, but yet when we come to a challenging conundrum, we get into the doldrums of life that we feel like we're beaten, we're defeated. And then I think, you know, the Lord is quite entitled to say, why are you operating in little faith when I've given you a measure so much greater than the little that you're operating in just now? Don't pour it out. Drink it in. <laughs> it was a test for the disciples. Maybe they didn't pass. But Jesus began immediately working on them to build that faith because he knew there was a lack. He didn't cast them aside. He didn't burn the bridge. He worked harder to help them grow. And he will do the same for you. God will bring the test, guys. We can't have a testimony. We all love testimonies, but we can't have a testimony without the test. 
Don't be in that case of the monies. Embrace the test and have the testimony in full. So let us work with him in the testing of our faith that next time around, when we come to that crossroads, we shall do better in Jesus' name. And that is the type of God we serve, folks. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm telling you, partner with God and know him. So the thing that I unpackaged from all of this study about this event, about them crossing this area, is that there's a perception issue here too. How do we perceive, what I, this is what I wrote here, how do we perceive what God can activate for us by believing in him? And are we, do we have the significant enough faith to be concerned enough to make the action occur? So have we seen the significance enough? Have we had a, a significant amount of faith poured into us that we believe, we know that action could occur? Now, we never like to hear this phrase, but there's this phrase that goes, O ye of little faith. Sometimes I really truly believe we all have little faith. Now, let me just unpackage some examples where O ye of little faith is mentioned. Matthew 6, 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall we not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Matthew 16, 8, which when Jesus perceived, perceived to them, he, say, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why ye reason ye among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. We know what that is, the feasting. Luke 12, 28, if then God so clothes the grass, which in the, is in day in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye little faith? So there's three references. Now, the first one and the third one were just different gospel perspectives. Matthew's gospel, Luke's gospel. One and I, eyewitness account in Matthew, Luke's gospel, a bit more of a, uh, and a conglomeration of eyewitness accounts, um, and who was a believer alongside the mighty Paul. Three words I want to give you tonight. Protection, provision, Perception. Protection, provision, perception. Have you ever felt like God would not protect you in a particular situation? Have you ever wondered if God was going to provide for you? Have you ever struggled to understand what God was trying to teach you? Can I answer truthfully to each one of those questions which invoke Protection, provision, and perception? Yes. The point is, you have faith today, and it's time to action it. God has everything in control in your life, and you can count on that. Faith in its purest form, I really believe, is an alignment with God and full-blown trust partnership, which is therefore explosive and almost like a weapon of mass destruction against the kingdom of darkness. See, in our conquest against belittling faith, we need an alignment. And how do we align? Well, one of the major ways of aligning with God is probably recognizing who God is and who's ministering to us. I don't also just mean spiritually. I mean in our churches, in our circumstances, in our life. Who do we have as our confidants and who do we have our confidence in? Because faith, listen comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're not spending times in this and knowing more of who God is, then this being a stimulus to us to sit with God, talk with God, marinate with God, be ministered to by, ministered to, uh, by his angels and his Holy Spirit, 
then we're, ne we're never really going to know the truth of God because we're going to be a confidence. Um, we're going to have a confidence concern where we're not going to know what's right from wrong, a questioning, a second guessing of ourselves. See, I've realized, right, and this is something that I want to portray to you. We come to these crossroads moments, time after time after time. And what happens is these crossroads moments are like maturity level moments. Our faith is stretched. Our faith is stretched to a breaking point. We're like, well, look, God, we know what you've done in the past, but I'm now at this crossroads again. And Lord, I can either deny all that is around me and trust you and keep on walking, or I can go around this circle and be in this circumstance. Very similarities to the Israelites walking around the wilderness, isn't it? And I'm not telling, I'm not saying, by the way, like I've heard some people, that means you'll be tested again with the same test, tested again with the same test. It's not like pass, it's not like fail, fail, fail. This is the 16th time you've done this test. But I can tell you, it might only happen once. This was the revelation that I got. It might only happen once. But here's the way it replays in this time machine catastrophe. The mind. Your mind replays the event. Oh, if only. Oh, if only. Oh, if only. And a root begins to grow a bitterness that can cast you and confine you to a minuscule version of who you are in the kingdom, almost like a worm. And I'll say something about a worm later on. So remember you had the faith you had before. It was God-given. Remember the measure that's been poured into you. Remember the what God has said, done, and everything he's promised by his life. And move in it and move that crossroads. Do not be defeated and say, you know what, Lord? I know that you are for me and not against me. I know that I'm the righteousness of Christ through you, Jesus. I know that I have your blood covenant and protection. I know that I'm wearing the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I know that I have the shield of faith. I know that I have the sword of your spirit and word. I know that I have the sandals of peace. And I know I'm cast together with a belt of truth. Activate that truth. I love that, that it's the belt of truth that's around your stomach area, you can say. You can grab a hold of your belt and say, rawhide, let's run with the truth. <laughs> it's no mistake when Jesus' cousin says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and that perseverance, let it finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wow. Maturity has an assignment and a link. The possession of maturity in Christ, being sanctified in him as a process of sanctification, knowing more of who he says we are and who we are in him. We have been giving utensils operations, program to complete the tasks that are around us. <laughs> I want to be provided with every utensil to have a full life. And that is something that Jesus absolutely promises. I don't want to be walking in the wilderness once again and being in that desolation of depravity that I don't have the utensils to fight the new battle, that I am weighed on the balance and found wanting. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. See the link? If you're at that crossroads, my friend, it's time to embrace the faith that you already own, that Jesus has already given you. Come on, run, 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 run through that situation and know that you are free indeed in Jesus' name. You're not bound by any circumstance. You're not outdone by any character. You're not folded by any disease. You're not cast down by any debt. You're not destroyed by any lie. All these strongholds come down in Jesus' name. See, the battle is the Lord's. And if we're not trusting in faith, we're battling ourselves. Ourselves 
against against the forces of darkness and we're battering battling and battering ourselves in so many ways see the bible says this we do not war against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand it in the evil day and having done all to stand firm stand therefore having fastened on all that armor that I was telling you about, the belt of truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of your feet, the readiness given by the sand, uh, by the gospel, the sandals of peace, and in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish every flaming dart of the evil one and the helmet of salvation, that the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, will be in your hand and praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Running back to what James was saying about maturity and the utensils we have at our disposal. All of these armors and equipment are in our armory and at free access to us. But sometimes we leave the house without those coverings. We put on instead hmm, a robe of shame, a helmet of depression, a breastplate of curse, a belt of lies, and sandals of strife. Have you met people like that? Have you been like that? Maybe I've been like that. It's time to repent of that and say, Lord, Lord Jesus, I want to operate in your faith. Activate that measure of faith that's inside me, Lord Jesus. Renew me unto your present calling. Renew me into your sanctification. Renew me into your mind and run me. I just see this vision of a scale electrics of cars that are going round and round and round and round and round and round and round. But the Lord is saying, why are you playing on such a small track when you're a Formula One car set for the greatest highways? Wow. Come on, guys. Let us realize what we have. We're not a scale electric car. We're a Formula One. We are a massive entity of mass destruction against those darknesses around us that these things cannot rob the joy the thief the bible says john 10 10 comes to steal kill and destroy why because he knows that there's a product of life that he that he lost that he wants to try and take away from us because if we he knows if we can operate in that life and god's life and god's reality his zoe then we can use dunamos and esosia to take power and authority and destroy his kingdom and take and release every single captive Come on. I hope I'm firing you up. So what is faith? <laughs> Let's see my time. Oh, my gosh. I need to get going. So what is faith and where is it? Well, faith in Hebrews 11.1 1, is described as this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. Faith has an action, a consequence, and a response that is physically activated. That's James 2 verse 14. The Greek for that um, in there, by the way, about faith without works is dead. That word works is ergon, E-R-G-O-N. And that actually means an action to the inner conviction. And that is true. If your faith is moving you, right, if you're being moved to do something, you're like, oh, I see that old lady across the road that needs help. And the Holy Spirit will say, go help her, go help her. And yeah, now, I, you know, I'll pray that someone comes and helps her. No, 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 no. Be activated in that obedience and go. You never know what that, what the, the domino effect of obedience might do and release in someone's life that she can go home and say, you know, this guy came to me, helped me carry my bags into my car. And guess what? He was a Christian. I thought Christians were were long gone. I've not, I've not had anybody speak to me about Christ since my late husband passed away. Wow. Now, I know that's just a facetious example that's coming off the top of my head, but I'm telling you, I would not be surprised if it's prophetic. If you see it, do it. Remember my words, spring spurred on a good actions. Faith in the Greek, by the way, action to the inner conviction, is also defined as a persuasion. 
And by the way, the reason why I'm referencing Greek is because the New Testament was originally written in Greek. So it's good to sometimes do this. I would encourage you, if there's words that, the, if there's a scripture that you're leaning on, leaning on, leaning on and marinating in and the Lord is saying, uh, or the Lord is giving your focus to a certain word in there. This is what I do, seriously. I go on to Google, I take time, I read the Greek and lexicon and I unpackage things to find out more. I'm just giving you that free of charge. You can buy the sermon tape later. Um, but here's what it says. <laughs> that is a persuasion. So when I found out that the Greek classifies it more of a persuasion, it made me think of this phrase. A per that, that, have you ever heard of the phrase that, oh, you have a particular persuasion? So the definition of persuasion, two definitions of persuasion, an unaccountable noun, which persuasion is the act of persuading someone to do something or to believe that something is true. And the countable noun is if you are of a particular persuasion, and I think this fits more faith, you have a particular belief or set of beliefs. You have a particular response. Let's therefore take that understanding into much more of this helps, H-E-L-P-S, word study of the Greek, which is P-I-S-T-I-S, -I which is faith. Faith, this study says, is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced in people. In short, the faith, listen to this now, for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human belief or confidence, but yet involving it in partnership. The Lord continuously births faiths in the yielded believer so that they can know what he prefers, i.e. the persuasion of his will, 1 John 5, 4. It is therefore, listen to this, I, I, this was just so good, I couldn't put it into any better words myself. It is the act whereby a person lays hold of God's resources, becomes a, God's resources, becomes obedient to what he has prescribed, and putting aside all self-interest and all self-reliance, trusts him completely. It is an unqualified surrender of the whole of one's being dependent on him. It is wholly trusting and relying upon him for all things. It is not just mental assent to the facts and realities of truth. It must come from a deep inner conviction because the Bible says, Demons also believe, but they're not acting in faith. Now do you realize the utmost importance of things like Proverbs 3, 5? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And he that trusts in his own heart is a fool. But the person who walks wisely... He shall be delivered. Proverbs 28, 26. But there's an importance, however. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this. Without God, oh, whoops. Without faith, faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and must believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Faith is simply given to us, one theologian says, along with his grace and mercy, according to his holy plan and purpose. And because of that, he gets all the glory. We all love Martin Luther King, right? Listen to this. Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. Thomas Aquinas, a famous theologian, says this, to the one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To the one without faith, no explanation <laughs> is possible. St. Augustine, faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of faith is to see what you believe. Charles Spurgeon, my faith rests not in who I am or shall be or how I feel or no, but in what Christ is and what he has done and what he is doing for me. Wow. Have faith in Jesus Christ. So there's a paradox to believing, isn't there? Against believing in faith. 
but actually they have the same root word in the Greek. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So I guess that's similar to faith, right? But believing is a bit more, I would say, what the definition says is self-serving. It leads to, but also precedes God's in birthing of the faith that he's wanting to release. So I guess that's kind of like saying, you know what, Lord? You're in that service. You don't know Lord. You don't know the Lord. And all of a sudden, everything begins to make sense to you. You're giving that point of revelation. There's the beginnings of the pourings of faith. And you're like, oh, I need to accept this gift of faith. Lord, I believe. Isn't that the statement when we all say that we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord? That's a belief moment. And then we absorb the faith that he's willing to pour out for us. Belief then is putting trust with, to have faith in. It's a credit or an implication to entrust or to put trust with. Faith and belief, therefore, are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, and the words in Greek for faith are most commonly used to mean persuasion. So the belief results to the, what did I say before? I'm going to read it again. The belief results in the particular or peculiar persuasion. <laughs> Praise God. Belief and faith, I guess, are not exactly equivalent terms, but Jesus keeps on saying, your faith has made you well. Faith is still the gift, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but any gift once you've received, again, I see that, those crossroads, once you've received that gift of faith, that pouring of faith, there is more. There is more faith because we can say, and this is how I know there is more faith. I'm thankful of the Lord that he poured this into me, right? When we come to that new scenario and circumstance or when we're being interviewed by that person, I hear this statement come out of people's mouths quite a lot. I, You know, uh, what I'm experiencing now, if it had been when I was in my early 20s or when I was first believing, I wouldn't have had the faith for it. But now God... <laughs> now God has been so good. I have seen the results of his goodness, of his promise, and I have resulted in the increase of the faith that he has given me. That that means when I come to this, I am emboldened with a new faith to tackle it. So get to this crossroads and don't be embarrassed to say, Lord, help my unbelief. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Lord. Come and pour into me that I might be activated in you in a new way that I might reach you. Let us partner together, Lord. I believe in you. I know you can pour this faith. Come down with me arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with your Holy Spirit and let us take this territory. I'm excited by stuff like this. Hmm. <laughs> we need the faith like the centurion. As thou hast believed, ho oh, oh, ho, so shall it be done unto thee. Great faith is a belief that power and authority are in the hands of God. The power and authority of Jesus Christ and not in the hands of mortal men. How many of you have your hands only in mortal men? Labels, COVID, debt, disease, distress, depression. Come to Christ, my friend. God gives to every man a measure of faith, the Bible says. People are often seeking faith, but most of the time we have it already in our heart. Faith is the power to believe right. Everyone has the power and the privilege to believe their God in faith. And it's true then, therefore, what the Bible says, that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12 gives an account of this. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and I've, I'm so thankful that I am around at Communion House, a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside these weights, these circumstances, and that sin which is so easily ensnaring you, my friend, and me, and, and you, and let us run, let's continue to run at that crossroads with endurance for the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, hallelujah, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand side of the throne of God. For consider him. And I'm going to take a moment of silence after this point. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Perspective. The perspective of God's word. What we are enduring currently is nothing to what Christ endured. But we have at the armory of our disposable at of our at our disposal tongue twister there every good weapon to take this territory the only way we can silence fear therefore is to embrace our identity and have a unique calmness and a peace so vigilant and unmoved by the circumstances throwing at us that there is no mistake that the faith has emboldened us with a new, great, big, reinforced shield that every fiery dart is boomed away in every circumstance. On saying that, you can't stand in a defensive place all the time. Eventually, you need to go on the attack, led by the Spirit and fueled by His Word. So you see then, a lot of these issues of faith, therefore, is an identity issue. Royalty and sovereignty is not called into immediate reaction. There's a point in the news just now that looked for the palace to give an immediate reaction of the British royal family. But they waited a few days. See, they had a poised nature and calculated response. Sometimes, and listen, I'm guilty as charged, our immediate immaturities need fine-tuning. They need rubbed off. God forms a diamond under pressure. So sometimes we're like diamonds in the rough. We need those rough edges racked and rattled and rocked off us. Because, and this is not a word of a lie, listen, I was on this walk, no, run recently. Trust me, I do run at Swanee Greenway. And there was just something in my heart about something that I have been personally struggling with. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Can I be truthful? Will, you're a giant, but why sometimes do you act like a worm? What convicting word. And I will unpackage that before we finish tonight. But there's one final thing I want to bring out of this study, and that's the salt connection. And it has to link with the worm. The King James Version of the Bible has a verse that is not seen in something like the NIV ESV. Forgive my Shakespearean English. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost his saltiness, wherewith will ye season it again? Have salt in yourselves and have peace in one another. Mark 9, 48. See, the worms that worm our way into our life and cause us to question our identity, cause us to belittle God, are, are ill-faithful responses. They're deceitful in themselves and they say that, no, God doesn't truly love me. God doesn't want to truly protect me. Remember those things, the protection, the preservation, the perception. That, in effect, is salt losing its saltiness. Salt has some great features that I'm about to tell you about. But if we allow the worm to continue to eat, that we lose ourselves in the process, the punishment after death will never cease. We need to know Christ. You need to know Christ, my friend. If you're listening to this and don't know him, it's time to come home. Salt, 
One theologian, Albert Barnes, in 1834 said this, also um, referencing a very other, uh, another very renowned theo theologian, which is Mondrell, says this, Salt is found in the earth in veins or layers, but when exposed to the sun and rain, it loses its saltiness entirely. Mondrell, the theologian, said this, I broke a piece of the salt off that which had been exposed to the rain sun and air though it had sparks and particles of salt it had perfectly lost its savor the inner part which was connected to the rock however retained its savor as i found by proof Wow. <laughs> oh, guys, listen to that. And that's in the natural. In many circumstances, once salt has lost its saltiness, the only thing it is good for is to be thrown on the ground. St. Augustine said the following, if you, by whom the nations are to be salted, shall lose the kingdom of heaven through fear of temporal persecution, issues, circumstances, who are they by whom your error shall be corrected? Another copy has this. If the salt has lost all sense, showing that they must be esteemed to have lost their sense, who sither who pursuing abundance or fearing the lack of temporal goods, lose which is eternal. And they've got taken away all their faith by men. They're of no use. They're a giveaway. See, these... Mentions of salt are crucial because Leviticus 2.13 says this, you shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of your covenant with God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So there's much more that me than meets the eye in this salt revelation then, because what is it about salt? Well, a quick 101 of salt is used to preserve and slow decay, but it also has an um, an like an aspetic meaning that that means it's free from contamination and harmful bacteria. Basically salt in all its circumstances prevents infection. I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever had a mouth ulcer? One of the things that you can do is gargle salt water. It nips <laughs> so much, but it cures the imbalance. But you know, salt cannot cure in itself, but it helps stop the infection right at the root. So that's one identity of salt, but salt in also that time and context also spoke of friendship or deep relationships. And listen to this, according to ancient customs, a bond of friendship was established through the eating of salt. It was said that once you'd eaten a man's salt, you were his friend for life. God wanted every sacrifice to be a reminder of the desired relationship that he wanted to have with us. So both covenants that God wants us to have a realize of, when Moses is speaking to the priests, that your holy offering should be presented to the Lord with salt, and, and the other one, which is 2 Chronicles 13, 5, don't you know that the Lord God of Israel has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants uh, forever by a covenant of salt? Ezekiel also uses the same symbolism of salt. When you have finished purifying it, you are to offer it, offer a young bull and a ram of the flock, both without defect. You are to offer them before the Lord, and the priests are to sprinkle salt on them and sacrifice them as a burnt offering to the Lord. This was a reminder to Ezekiel and the priests of God's lasting commitment to his people. So when God requires salt to be a part of his grain offering, it wasn't just for a random reason of flavor. It was so deeply symbolic. It showed the relationship of God want, that he wanted to have with his people and how his people wanted to be a preservative. He wanted his people to be a preservative, a reality, a goodness to the earth. Salt always preserves, fights infection is never corrupted and is always pure as long as it is connected to the rock. There is the reference I want to find. So let us have what Paul says 
assaulted speech. And let us be that person that we say to the Lord, you know what, Lord, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Psalm 56 verse 3. Cast all your anxieties when you're going through them on him because he does care for you. Embrace that faith. Remember what the same man was told, O ye of little faith. Conclusion. At the end of the day, it's so operate to, it's so important to operate in this because otherwise your life is just a misery of circumstance. And therefore, what benefit in the observation of you is there to believing in God if your life is as miserable as your next door neighbor? Especially when you are supposed to be tapped into the supernatural. The world tells us not to forget. The word tells us not to forget his benefits. My friend, it's time not to forget. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul, all that is within me, bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeemed your life from the pit, who crowned you with love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That is where true peace lies. And the peace that Christ gives to us, the word says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled and let them neither be afraid. Activate the peace. Ask for that spiritual gift of faith. First Corinthians 12, verses 12, verse 9. And let us live a life above. Above, A, absolute, B, boundless, O, office, which is victorious and effective. An absolute boundless office, which is victorious and effective. Let us live above. An absolute boundless office, which is victorious and effective. Let us live above. See, my friends, there is no other name by which we can be saved, the Bible says. We've been given authority by Jesus' departure, as it says in Luke 10, 19, via Esosia, see Colossians, verse 2.10. And now the Holy Spirit has given us dynamite, dunamos. We are kingdom warriors. And every promise of the Lord is true, that I have come, that they might have life, that we might have life, that you might have life and live it to the full. Here is the reality, friends, and I finish on this. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. You have a life. You have so much good at your disposal. You can have this identity. I am not unique. I am just embrace the uniqueness of who Christ says I am. I'm a king. I'm a Lord. I'm a giant because of who he says I am. And by the way, when I say Lord, I'm thinking of the Lairds of heaven. The the Highland warriors, the goodness of the people, the people that will judge righteously by the input that Christ has placed into them. It's time to have a new helmet on our mindset that we can know a salvation Christ bound mindset that we when things come through the gateway of our eyes, the light, the message, what we hear and what comes out from our heart, we can be the best response that we can be, that we can stand back and not be an immature, immediate response, but we can embrace the maturity in every utensil of the spirit to fight the good fight of faith. Praise God for you, my friend. Let us pray before we go. And I just thank you for taking the time to listen to this. I'm sorry, it's been longer than I expected. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, I pray for those watching. Let them find faith. Let them have a pouring of your faith. Let them have a new measure unfold. If you're at this crossroads, I pray, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, 
You are my King. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I believe in you. You're a good Father. You're a good, <laughs> you're a good, good God. You are my Majesty. You are majestic. You are my Lord. You are my God. Come into my heart. Come and renew me. Come and reveal yourself to me. I confess that you are these things and I believe in you. I confess that you are these things and I believe in you. I remind Satan, I belong to Jesus. I call to remembrance everything that is around me, that you are gone, gone, gone when it comes to Jesus' name. I now embrace his spirit. I now embrace his identity. I now embrace the goodness of God. And I will live the life that he has called me to live in faith, believing, set free. Oh, praise God in your holy name. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time, would you please get in touch with us at Communion House? You can email us at info at Communion House. You can DM us. You can Facebook us. You can Instagram us. You can Come to one of our in-person services and be connected because we really want you to be ignited. We really want to fellowship and equip and disciple you to be the best Christ-born witness that you can be. And that includes being reactivated or activated fully in word and in faith. Thank you tonight for watching. God bless you and have a great evening. Over and out. <laughs>